Hello, Woodman. We are so glad that you've joined us today to worship together and to learn. And no matter where you are in your spiritual journey, you are welcome here. You may just be checking out faith or you may have walked with Jesus for years. You are welcome just where you are. And you may be thinking, gosh, I'd like to get more connected. And one opportunity that we have for you is City Serve on October 3rd. It's a day where we come together with various churches and organizations in the city to meet the tangible needs of folks in our city. And you can sign up for that on our, on our website. And also on our website, right on our homepage, is a button that says connect today. If you're looking to get, looking to get connected with people in your age group, maybe you wanna join a community group or a huddle, or you just have questions about faith, you can click on connect today and we look forward to following up with you. And in this season where there's so much craziness, it's so awesome to know that God is still in the business of changing lives. We're gonna to get to watch the stories of life change as we celebrate baptism. Gary, tell the group here this morning why you wanna be baptized, baptized, brother. Well, I was baptized once when I was little, but I didn't know the, the meaning behind it. But first off, I'd like to thank my family's in the audience for getting me to this point. And you don't realize it, the worshiping of false idols, false gods, what car you drive, how much money you have. It's funny how you keep checking these boxes, but you, you feel empty inside. 100% feel empty inside. And it took me this long to realize that, what was missing. So I thank my family for getting me to this point and accepting Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. Amen, Gary. It's foolish to gain the whole world to forfeit your soul. And what a testimony for all of us that maybe have family that aren't where we think they need to be and we can get despondent and their faithfulness and their patience with you. And then you're recognizing that what really matters has brought you to this spot. And it is an honor for us to baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit because of your profession of faith in Jesus. I know your testimony we visited a number of times it's you've been through a lot and in that a lot you met Jesus so because of that newfound peace and love that you had that you didn't have before why do you want to get baptized today three years ago I made a choice to turn my life over to God being baptized today I'm washing away the hurt and mistakes of my past today I'm starting a new blank chapter in my walk with my father So, Christy, based on your profession of faith and wanting to start new today, we baptize you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Audrey has a, has a really cool story, story, and her and her mom started watching Woodman um, online and actually your first um, experience in students was our virtual winter camp and since we've been back in person we got to meet Audrey as she's coming to uh, students but started off coming to Woodman online so cool you want to tell everyone why you want to be baptized I want to be baptized and take the next step in my faith uh, to honor what Jesus did for me and to confirm my commitment to Christ Amen. proud of you Audrey it is uh, because of that professional faith that we are going to baptize you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Michaela, you tell us why. Tell this group of great people why you want to be baptized this morning. I'm so happy that I accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior. <laughs> and that really is all there is to it, Michaela. It's the work that he did on your behalf, not that you did. And so it is Howie and I's real honor to be able to baptize you today in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit.
Tom, tell the group why you want to be baptized this morning. Um, I want to be baptized with my son. So we've been we've been waiting, and um, this was a great opportunity. Much more comfortable than being inside. Um, and for a father to know that your son had, truly has a belief in Christ is it means for eternity, right? I know where I'm going to spend uh, who I'm going to spend that with uh, besides God. Um, and as a parent, I, I think we all kind of go through the same things where we want our, the best for our kids, whether it's school, sports, all of those things. And it's at times like this, you realize how really insignificant those things are. That it, it, it just doesn't even begin to compare to, uh, to this. And uh, the final thing I'll say is that um, it's even more special for us because when my wife was pregnant with, with Thomas, she uh, was diagnosed with uh, cancer. So uh, stage four metastatic liver cancer. And so the only option we were given was to abort. Thomas and to more aggressively treat her cancer, uh, not to cure it, but just to extend her life. So we opted to go the holistic route. My wife lived a couple of years. He was born uh, 10 and a half weeks premature. Um, an emergency C-section, the umbilical cord was, was wrapped around his neck. So I've seen him resuscitated on multiple occasions. And um, I don't need anybody to feel sorry for me. Actually, I feel sorry for people who haven't been put in this position because you really get to know the gospel when you have nothing else. So. It is a spiritual resuscitation that God has done in your life to bring your spirit from death to life and meet you. And thank you for sharing because of your profession of faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and your only hope for eternity and where you'll be. It's Pastor Howie and I honor, man, to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Just heard a little bit about Thomas. Give it up for Thomas. <laughs> Thomas, tell the group here why you want to be baptized this morning, brother. Yeah, I've been putting off uh, being baptized for many years, so I think it's time to finally commit my love for Jesus fully. <laughs> Amen. Thomas, you have. Uh, live to see uh, the necessity of the gospel and the trials that this world and death and pain bring. But you know Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior. And because of that, your dad and I are excited to be able to baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Jane, why did you want to be baptized? I wanted to be baptized because I can't imagine my life without Jesus. I wanted to show others that I belong to him. So based on your profession of faith that you want to demonstrate to your friends and community that you're a follower of Jesus, we baptize you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Welcome to church. We're so glad to have you um, be a part of the service today. And what an honor to watch people model the death to life that comes with following Jesus. Um, we were dead in our transgressions and Jesus has made us and has made all things new. Um, so as we worship together, wherever you find yourself today, we're praying that you would know the power of Jesus who really walked on this earth, who really conquered death and is alive and active now. May he be present in our homes. May he be present as we sing together today. Let's worship together now. See his hands, see his 
feet and touch his scars and believe he is risen he is risen he's alive Savior on that curse. 
Now, if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become manifest, for the day will disclose it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. If the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him, for God's temple is holy and you are that temple. Well, hello, Woodman. I was in high school when the rose disappeared. I walked in, beginning of a new year, and suddenly all the seats were arranged in clusters in these groups. I, I sort of thought maybe the custodian had made a mistake. I guess what's sort of funny about it now is my sons are going to remember when it went back to Rose. But <laughs> I digress. The real shock was the startling announcement that for some projects, we were going to work in groups and all receive the same grade for our work. Now, I'm sure the hope was to increase collaboration, uh, the exchange of ideas, really kind of foster a team spirit. But what happened instead, for, for, for me anyways, was a rapid descent into popularity and exclusivity. I wanted to be in a certain group. I mean, like, those two were really smart, so they, they should be in here. And he, he had, he had an awesome house. It would be great to have to work there. And she, well, I just think she'd be a great addition to the team. And I told myself, all groups need a presenter. So surely they would have a place for this guy. It was not exactly what the teacher had hoped for. And to be blunt, it's not exactly what God wants for his church either. We're studying the New Testament letter of 1 Corinthians in a series entitled Undivided, which is unfortunately not something the church at Corinth could say about themselves. As we have seen already, they had divided themselves into contentious, self-seeking factions or cliques. Some were following Paul, some were following Apollos. I'm for Peter, some would say. The church had become permeated with this divisive party spirit. The Apostle Paul, had already said to them, not cool, at the beginning of chapter 1. But now in chapter 3, he is going to give what will be the first of several spiritual spankings in the letter. And, and, and that is this. If you understand the gospel of Jesus Christ, Jesus, who is in the very form of God, did not account equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he humbled himself by taking the form of a servant, by being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form. He humbled himself by being obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. For the forgiveness of our sins, if you understand that, Paul is saying, quit acting like children. Stop it. Quit your petty fighting, your arrogant posturing, and get on the same page. Hey, we're building the church with worldly values and wisdom, and that is not what Jesus bled and died for. That is not how his church is to be built. Now, I am not as old as some of you, but I am a lot older than most. And I have never 
never seen such an angry, divided group of Christians in all my life than what we are seeing today around us. And it has got to stop. Uh, This is written to the Corinthians. But in a lot of ways, it, it could be written to us today. Paul gets spicy. And so if you've started this and you already know that you're in a bit of a spicy mood yourself, if, if you're a little feisty, it might be best to press pause and come back later because uh, Paul gets direct. So with that warning in mind, I think we certainly need prayer. Let us do that. Heavenly Father, as much as it pains me to, to, to acknowledge, I, I am thankful for, for a word uh, that will challenge me. You know, I'd like everything to go my way. Um, the only problem is I'm so often wrong, and I, and I need your word to sort of be that spiritual dashboard that directs me to what is true. And in saying that, Father, I don't think I'm alone And so, God, I pray, no more than other weeks, but but pointedly today, I ask for your spirit to fill us. I ask that you would give us ears to hear, open our eyes that we could see. Help me not say anything that you wouldn't have me say. Help me not make any mistakes in the words I'm about to deliver and be glorified in us. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, if you have a Bible, go ahead and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And the first thing is this. Paul's going to say, quit acting like children. Quit acting like children. We read chapter 3, verse 1. But I, brothers and sisters, could not address you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh, as infants in Christ. I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for it. And even now you are not yet ready, for you are still of the flesh. For while there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not of the flesh and behaving only in a human way? For when one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos, are you not being merely human? This is, I think, one of the misinterpreted, most misinterpreted, most misunderstood passages in the letter. So, so why don't we start with what Paul is not saying, what this is not communicating. Paul is not talking about baby Christians. He's not talking about baby Christians. He's not talking about those who need a diet of spiritual baby formula before they can handle red meat, but rather he's talking about those who should be mature Christians but are instead acting like babies. It's not good. Now, last week, we saw at the end of chapter 2 how Paul defined spiritual people. He defined those as the people who understand and accept the gospel and therefore are indwelt by the Holy Spirit. They've recognized Jesus as Lord. They believed he died and rose again, and they've invited him to forgive them their sins. And the Spirit has indwelt them. Paul is not suggesting anything otherwise about the Christians in Corinth. He does believe, convinced they have the Spirit, but he needs to address them as if they don't. Because they're not acting like spiritual people. They're acting like people of the flesh. That is, they're acting like people who don't have the Spirit. They are acting just like an unbelieving world. You say, what gives Paul the moxie to say something so sharp? Well, it's that they were not applying the gospel that they believed to the lives they were living. 
They were not applying the gospel they believed to the lives that they were living. Jesus, the son of God, put on flesh and became a servant, even to the point of death. Jesus literally died for those who were against him. But in Corinth, that same kind of selfless, sacrificial love for one another was nowhere to be seen. Instead, Paul says there was jealousy and strife among them. I follow Paul. I follow Apollos. And if you do not agree with me, you're wrong. And Paul says to them, that's just like the world. Quit acting like babies. If they were really as wise and mature as they thought they were, they would recognize the gospel wasn't baby formula to move on from, but it was instead the only well balanced diet they required. Or, as one commentator said it, they didn't need a change of diet. They needed one of perspective. They they had to change their perspective. And and I want to ask this lovingly, but do you? Do you need a change of perspective today? Have you believed and accepted the gospel, but then subsequent to that confession of faith, looked down and acted in an unloving way towards people who do not see things exactly the way you do. When when people do that, it's because people tell themselves they are right and only standing for the truth. But Paul would say, Jesus was right but he acted in a very different way towards others. Quit acting like kids and stop your fighting. And it isn't that we cannot hold different opinions. It's what brings rich diversity to our community. But we are supposed to behave lovingly towards those who do not share all of our opinions. We need to quit acting like children because we are all servants. Look at verse five. What then is Apollos? Uh, What is Paul? Servants through whom you believed as the Lord assigned to each. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. He who plants and he who waters are one, and each will receive his wages according to his labor. For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field, God's building. This, I think, could be the New Testament application of Psalm 127 verse 1. Unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. Uh, this, this is Paul bringing Jesus' words, Mark 10, 45, to bear. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to give his life as a ransom for many. It's interesting, Paul doesn't even say, who is Paul? He doesn't say, who is Apollos? But what? Seeing the division, seeing the fighting, he's like, what what is even Paul? What is Apollos? Just servants. They're just servants that God has assigned. And he uses the picture of a farm to make his point. He's like, guys, you, you were a field, 
okay? I came in. I planted. Then I left, and Apollos came in, and, and he watered. But it, God, it was God who made things grow. So who cares? Who cares who planted? Who cares who watered? God is the one that's brought the growth. Verse 8, he who plants and he who waters are one. And each will receive his wages according to his labor. You know, in and out is scheduled, right, to open in Colorado Springs later this year. Do not tell me there's nothing good in 2020, right? Awesome news. Now, let's say you go and you apply for a job. And, and, and they put you on patties. You're going to be grilling those delectable little treats all day long. But another buddy, friend of yours, says, I'm, I'm, I applied too. And, and, and they get a different job. Uh, they're putting the lettuce, the tomato, and the spread on. Do you think you would ever go to your manager and say, you know, um, I've been thinking about it. I deserve a raise. <laughs> Apart from me, you guys are handing out veggie sandwiches. Huh? What, 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 what would the manager reply? Actually, you're doing just what we asked of you, and, and, and we, <laughs> we pay you for it. So, so if you don't want to grill the burgers, you can get another job. Pa Paul's point is, why, Corinthians, why are you lifting up and exalting the toppings guy? Why are you all about the guy who works the grill? Why would you say you follow Apollos? Why would you say you follow Paul? God gave us each different jobs. We simply did what God asked. Why are you following either of us? You should be following only God. This is about God. It's, it's not about us. Which is why I love that the ESV, the English Standard Version that we're reading from here, retains the original placement of the words in verse 9. God's fellow workers, God's field, God's building. In each case, God is stated first. We are God's workers. You are God's field. You are God's building. We are all just servants who serve at the pleasure of the king. Uh, the world, the world doesn't see it that way. Right now I'm on camera. Uh, Isabel and, and, and Stephen are not. And in, in the world's estimation, uh, they say things like, the person who's on this stage well, is more important than the people who are off of it. The gospel, though, the gospel understands that we are actually each just servants doing the job that God has assigned to us. Not one more important than the other, not one more valued, just fellow servants who seek to do the things God has called us to and trust that he will bring growth as a result of it. You see me a lot more but God doesn't care about them any less. We're just fellow servants. We need to be very careful 
to never elevate somebody over another. This is God's thing. We need to build wisely. That's our third point. Look at verse 10. According to the grace of God given to me, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation, and someone else is building upon it. Let each one take care how he builds upon it, for no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become manifest, for the day will disclose it, because it will be revealed by fire. And the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. If the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. Uh, Verse 9 serves as a transitional verse. Paul is moving from this, this field metaphor to a building one. He says, you are God's building. And Paul starts with, according to the grace of God given to me, I got to be number one. Wasn't that I earned it? I'm not the starting quarterback after sitting on the bench for seven years, but practicing really hard. No, according to the grace of God given me, I was brought in to lay the foundation for this church, which is and only can be the gospel of Jesus Christ. And since then, Others have come. Others have come and built upon that foundation. Apollos was one who came after me and built upon that foundation of the gospel that I laid. And indirectly at this point, Paul's saying, and and you know, y'all are building upon the foundation I laid too. Paul's warning is, you'd better be building smart. I think we can all readily understand that there can be a difference when it comes to workmanship, right? Contractor-grade fixtures are not as nice as custom stuff. (laughs) And a single-pane window, looking at it, might not look all that different than a double-pane one. But the latter, I mean, it's better. And as you build in Christian ministry, Paul says to them and would say to us, we had better build smart, better build wisely, because there is a day coming when God will reveal the quality of our work. And we don't need to get hung up on the distinctions between the different elements that Paul lists. Really, he's talking about two things, stuff that survives through a fire and stuff that does not. Stuff that will be burned up and some that will remain. You want to build with the stuff that will survive the fire to come. And telling somebody that they really need to follow Apollos, that's not going to last. It's gone. Verse 15 is another one of those often misunderstood verses. It's not talking about purgatory. And and it's not talking about some carnal Christian who slips into heaven by the skin of his or her teeth. He is talking about somebody who is a Christian and has given themselves in service of the church. But because they emphasize something other than the gospel, on that day, all that they have built will be destroyed. To be clear, they won't be. But like someone building a house and it catches on fire, they will run out, 
smelling like smoke. They are saved because of their belief in Jesus. But all the things they spent their life focusing on, all of their effort will be lost. Are you sure? Are you certain that you are building something that will last? I want to build with gospel grade materials. I do not want you out in our community talking about whether or not Woodman is gathering in large groups on the weekend. And when asked, I want you to say, that's the wrong question. What you need to be asking is, do they proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ in that place? It's not whether a church meets in large groups. It's not about whether a church chooses something smaller. It's about the gospel of Jesus Christ and him crucified for the forgiveness of sins. Do not accept anything less than gospel-grade materials. Have you? Are you more proud because we have stayed closed than you are that we preach the gospel? Are, are, are you angry because we've stayed closed instead of proud because the gospel's preached here? We want to build wisely. And if we're not careful, all of us could inadvertently tear down that which God is trying to build up. We need to be careful. Look at verse 16. Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. For God's temple is holy and you are that temple. Now, a little later on, uh, Paul is going to use the same picture to talk about our individual lives and bodies. He, he's going to affirm that when we embrace Christ as Lord, his Holy Spirit takes up residence in us. And in, in that, we as individuals are, are like little temples of God. But here, Paul is not talking about individuals. He's talking about the church corporate. He's talking about the assembled church those believers in Corinth, and he's like, do you not know that you guys collectively are God's temple? And he says, if anyone destroys God's church, God will destroy him. And you say, well, what does that mean exactly? I'll be honest, I'm not entirely sure. But I will tell you this, it's not good. This is a stern warning. It reminds me of Jesus' words in Matthew 18, 6, right? But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a great millstone fastened around his neck and be drowned in the depths of the sea. We had, be, we had better be darn sure that what we are building is going to last and not inadvertently tear down what God is trying to rise up. Because if we put up some sort of shoddy construction that falls down and injures, that's bad for us. And I will tell you the insidious part of this, the real concern is that we all almost universally tell ourselves that the things that we believe are the things that matter. And I'm just taking a stand. These things that I hold to, these are the things that last. And some of us believe it with all of our heart. But I tell you this, Unless those beliefs or unless those feelings, unless those convictions are, are, are motivated and, 
and expressed in the spirit of the gospel. They're all going to burn. I mean, it's all going to go up in smoke. Do not be deceived. Verse 18, let no one deceive himself. If anyone among you thinks that he is wise in this age, let him become a fool that he may become wise. For the wisdom of this world is folly with God. For it is written, he catches the wise in their craftiness. And again, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise that they are futile. So let no one boast in men. For all things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or the present or the future. All are yours and you are Christ's and Christ is God's. Apart from Jesus and the transforming work of his spirit inside the hearts of men and women. Apart from Jesus, the hearts of men and women are naturally divisive. They are drawn to exclusivity and exclusion. They prefer, they prefer cliques and factions. They enjoy us and them. That is, apart from Christ, our natural habitat. So Paul says, you're going to need to become a fool in the world's eyes because we, we think something different. Do not be deceived and take the bait. When they tell you when they tell you the future of this country depends on a specific candidate, do not bite. When you are told you need to choose between black lives or blue lives, stand strong. And when you hear that the church needs to take a stand on anything other than the gospel of Jesus Christ, walk away. In Christ, all things are ours. So let no one boast in men, for all things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or the present or the future, all are yours and you are Christ's and Christ is God's. Paul is saying, you don't need to choose between people who have had a spiritual impact on your life. Each one was simply a servant that God assigned to minister to you. You can affirm them all. We don't need to worry about the state of our world, the decisions that people are making, our lives, our deaths, our future is bound up in the finished work of Jesus. You, if, if you have confessed Christ as Lord, you are his. And he is God's. And I'm telling you, you are in solid company if you stick with them and them alone. Do not be deceived. Do not fall prey to ideologies or factions apart from the saving gospel of Jesus Christ. And if you are tired of it, turn to him. Run to him this day. Thank him that all of this, that none of it is your concern. Commit yourself to proclaiming him and him alone. He is the sovereign Lord of the universe. And he is not the least bit concerned. Don't take the bait. 
you know, when I was pastoring in North Carolina, and by God's grace, our church was growing. People were coming to faith. God was doing some remarkable things, but we didn't have a building. And in what was a move of tremendous, had to have been humility, I was approached by another pastor, the pastor of a smaller Baptist church that wasn't growing and wasn't doing too well, but they had a building. And this pastor approached me and said, you know, what might it look like for us to merge, to make those two congregations one? And we met several times, and with each meeting, my enthusiasm grew. It was like an answer to prayer that I had not even been praying. And then this pastor told me that he'd run into some resistance from his deacon board. Uh, They were the highest authority in that church and said, mate, you should come and talk to them. And our churches were different. Our music was, was very different. It was certainly much louder. And I, I, mean, I, I, just, I didn't dress the same. But we both believed that this was God's word. We both were committed to proclaiming that there's only one name under heaven by which men and women can be saved, that of Jesus Christ. And yet those differences that did exist, one of the deacons looked at me and calmly, yet sternly, said, I would rather this church building be turned into a gas station before it goes to another church. Unfortunately, God did not give him his wish. But within a couple years, that facility was torn down and a Starbucks and I think a barbecue spot put in its place. Let's not be like that. It's not about the physical building, but it's about the church we're building. The people we're growing on the foundation of the gospel of Jesus Christ, him and him alone. The diversity that exists can be beautiful, but if, if it causes separation, it's got to go. Let's pray. Our God, forgive me for any of the, I suspect, numerous, countless times I've exalted something over and above the gospel of Jesus Christ. Any time I've said people must believe the gospel and see something the way I do, forgive me. And God, I pray you'd forgive us all. May this community and indeed this world see that we stand for the gospel, that we build upon the gospel and work our best to get along on that which causes division. Father, your son prayed that we would be one. May we see that in our midst. In Jesus' name, amen.
will not fear when darkness falls His strength will help me scale these walls I'll see the dawn of the rising sun The Lord is my salvation certainly have a plurality of opinions and things that we hold to that not everybody in our church does. Uh, but if you've been watching this and, and think for a moment that uh, this is saying that this place is falling apart, that's entirely not true. I think in our country right now, there's extreme division and a lot of anger. But by and large, men and women, young and old, at Woodman Valley Chapel are really trying to make this work. Do we have some that are different? Yeah. But every family does. We want to build something that lasts. We want to be a part of something that does not burn up. And if you 
want to get involved because that is your heart. We would love to have you join us. It's still not too late to get into a community group. It's still not too late to raise your hand and say, I want to serve. It's not too late to go online and give financially to support this work. It's not too late to be a part. We want to see God build something eternal here. It's not something I do. It's not something Steve and Isabel do. It's something he's called us all to do, fellow servants of Christ, for his fame and his glory. Now, as you go, to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. God bless you and have a great week.